Today is the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs Conference. It is a conference that we hold annually to provide information about issues that are important to people with disabilities, their families, and professionals that work with people with disabilities. We have over 400 people registered, and we're just really excited and looking forward to seeing all the people who really care about disability issues or in, involved in the disability community. Thank you all for coming. We'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs and the Office of Governor John Bell Edwards to the Claiborne Building for the 2019 GOTA Conference. We're going to begin the day. Um, unfortunately, our, our governor could not attend, but he did take some time out to create a video for, for you all to, to greet you, and we'd like to go ahead and play it. Uh, followed by me in the video would be our executive director, Ms. Bambi Palazzola, and our Chief of, and our Deputy Chief of Staff, Mr. Adrian O. Wilson, Dr. Adrian O. Wilson, uh, from the Governor's Office to provide remarks. It's an honor to welcome you all to the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs Conference. Our goal is to embrace the differences that make us all unique because every person deserves to live a happy and fulfilling life. 29 years ago today, President George H.W. Bush signed into law the Americans with Disabilities Act. This law broke down societal barriers that had long prevented many Americans from being able to live life to their full potential. And today we celebrate the anniversary of this important legislation by continuing to work toward a more accessible and inclusive society for people living with disabilities. I'd like to take a moment to share some of the ways my administration has been working to advance the vision of the ADA. We now have a tiered waiver plan that prioritizes individuals with a greater need for receiving the most appropriate home and community-based services, rather than offering services on a first-come, first-served basis. That has helped us eliminate a 25-year-old waiting list for specialized services. Since becoming governor of this great state, I've made it my priority to increase opportunities and employment for everyone. The state, as a model employer task force, has helped to develop policies and strategies to improve the rate of recruiting, hiring, and retention of Louisianans with disabilities within state government. I recently signed legislation that expands the rideshare opportunities in our state, and our aim is to encourage transportation companies who operate in this state to make their services fully inclusive, accessible, and affordable for individuals with disabilities. And earlier this year, our state held its first all-inclusive housing conference to discuss solutions to the housing challenges in our great state. These are just a few of the things we've been able to accomplish in 2019, and the year is far from over. You can be assured that my administration will continue seeking ways to make Louisiana and state government more accessible and inclusive of all citizens. And I am incredibly proud of the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs. They're doing great work. Please reach out to them if you ever have a question or need guidance. Thank you again for being here today. Enjoy the conference and God bless. Um, I'm Bambi Palazzola. I'm the executive director of the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs. And it's great to hear a message where the governor says that you're doing a good job. That's always good to hear. So uh, we appreciate him uh, sen sending a message to us this morning. And more importantly, I appreciate you all being here and all of your help in making this administration successful for people with disabilities. We end this year with making sure that all school systems must establish local special education advisory councils. The Advisory Council on Disability Affairs has established the Accessibility Committee to advise the governor on all issues and concerns regarding accessibility, including but not limited to barriers regarding communication, employment, architecture, and so much more. Because of you, our administration has made an important step in ensuring that our providers earn a living wage in a state um, by ensuring, excuse me, that, that, that and I'm going to pause for a moment because I, I know this is something that is really important. And I used to frame living wage. We know that we have so much more work to do, but I, I am excited that we've been able to ensure our providers um, 
get a decent wage by successfully restoring provider rates. It goes without saying because you all see it every day and you live it every day that, that even with these successes, we have so much more work to do. So much more work to do. But let me tell you, I am hopeful because with you and our governor, I know we will win for all of the people of this incredible state, for every single person in this room, for my four-year-old nephew. Here. And so I'm going to take you through a little bit of how we got to where we are on the disability movement. We are going to focus um, on Title II entities, um, which are your municipalities and your school districts and your colleges and universities. And I'll, I'll kind of explain that as we go along. But part of the reason that we're focusing on Title II is because there's an opportunity for those of you who are advocates to understand your roles and responsibilities for your own individual communities. And so we want to help you understand that as we move through the presentation today. 29 years ago, um, sadly, everybody in this picture, and this is the most famous picture of the signing of ADA, um, sadly, everybody except for San Sandy Perino um, has since passed away. That means only one thing to me, and that's that I'm getting old. <laughs> Um, so it's been um, it's been interesting. I've actually been involved in disability issues since 1977, and so um, this is something that isn't new to me. It's not. Um, it's not an effort to, you know, hang my, my shingle out there. It is a life passion. It is a life goal. It is a it is um, it is a purpose. Now, back when ADA was being created, back in the 80s, there were about 43 million people with disabilities. Okay, now get, getting the numbers of people with disabilities is kind of difficult to do um, because some people with disabilities don't want to include themselves in the population and other people think they are disabled and in, so we get mixed information. They look at things like, you know, wheelchair sales. Well, some people have three, four, five wheelchairs. They, so it's been a difficult number for them to gather, especially back in the 80s. We're much more accurate today. In 2000, it was the first time that they actually put uh, the question on the U.S. Census. And so that was the 10th anniversary of the signing of ADA, and that's when they figured out that it's roughly one-fifth of our population claims to have a permanent disability in the home. And so at the time that ADA was being created, there were about 43 million people with disabilities, and currently we are showing about one-fifth of our population. But there were only 12% that are employed. Now, a lot of people think of ADA as a construction law because there's construction elements to it, but it's a civil rights law. The whole push behind the ADA was to get people with, with disabilities back into the workforce. And so of the 88% that were unemployed, 80% were considered employable and they simply didn't have jobs. There were entities out there that would say, no, we'd be happy to hire them if they could only get in the front door. Okay, and so it drew a line in the sand and it said from this point forward, Everything that we build needs to be for everybody. And that's the simple exp explanation of what the ADA was and is. Okay, there was also a big push back in the 80s to develop what was referred to as sustain sustainable communities. We wanted places where people could move in in their, in their 20s and 30s, still be there in their 80s and 90s and still participate actively in civic life. And so all of this was encompassed to what the ADA was about. Now, it wasn't the first law out there on accessibility. As a matter of fact, um, in 1968, they came out with the Architectural Barriers Act. And the Architectural Barriers Act was written very much like the ADA, but it was only for federal projects, federal buildings, federal money. As a matter of fact, the very first line of the ADA exempts the federal government from compliance with the ADA, which really ticked off a lot of people. They're like, how come they don't have to do it? And it's because they were already covered and had been for over a decade by the ABA. Now, in 1973, they came out with the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. The Rehab Act is still a very active part of civil rights today. 
Those of you who represent municipalities, school districts, colleges, and universities, Section 504 of the Rehab Act is actually, from a litigation standpoint, a much bigger threat than the ADA is, and here's why. The ADA itself has no punitive or compensatory damages. And Section 504 of the, um, of the Rehab Act does have both punitive and compensatory damages. And so it's important that entities understand that. And when I say that, please understand I'm not a lawyer, but I've been doing expert witnessing on access-related cases all around the country for decades. And so I draw a lot from not only the cases that I've been part of, but those that I read about so that I can help entities understand what tools they need to come into compliance and avoid litigation. Okay. Now. Um, this says what I just told you about the Ar Architectural Barrier, I'm sorry, about, yeah, Architectural Barriers Act, which is known as the ABA. So we have the ABA and the ADA. So the ABA, um, like I said a minute ago, it was written very much like the ADA, but only for federal pro properties. The Rehab Act um, required, Section 504 of the Rehab Act required compliance with all program services and activities. That means everything that a public entity does has to be for everybody. And so if a library has a policy that says that you have to um, have a driver's license to check out a book, that's discriminatory because not everybody drives. Okay, and so it's looking not just at the infrastructure. It's not just about curb ramps and buildings. We have to look at everything that's offered and do we have compliance in every area. And the looking at all of those pieces was referred to in the law itself as developing a transition plan, self-evaluation and transition plan. If we put a sign in a restaurant that said blank is not welcome here, it would be all over Facebook, it would be all over Twitter, it would be everywhere. People would boycott the place, people would, you know, the news media would cover it. And that's exactly what a step says to somebody with a disability. And so for them to wait 29 years and still not be able to get into some place just really isn't, isn't acceptable. And so I do everything that I can to help educate what is the required and how it affects people if you don't bring it into compliance. There is help out there. There are companies like mine. A lot of people say, well, I didn't even know you existed. And, and we do accessibility. That's our goal, to help entities figure out from the beginning to the end everything that they need to do and get a plan in place to make it happen, whether they're Title II or Title III. Title II are required to have a plan, Title III or not. But a plan will help anybody, you know, kind of chip this away until everybody is served by everything that they do. Oh, the work of the of GOTA is just amazing in this state. We are so blessed to have a governor that recognizes the needs of our disability community. And I was here today, I had the privilege of speaking about Act 833 and the different diploma pathways for our students with disabilities. One of the big takeaways that I was hoping my audience would leave with is that many of our districts are still not implementing the promotion pathway in Act 833. Many school districts are telling them that Act 833 is only for high school students, only a pathway to graduation, but it is not. It is for all children, grades kindergarten on, who have a disability and an IEP, that their promotional decisions can be determined by their IEP team. And I hope that was their big takeaway today. All of us around the state in education really appreciate the wonderful job that our governor and his Office of Disability Affairs is doing in supporting us in our efforts to make public education as strong as possible in the state. I'm here today to serve as part of a health care panel this afternoon and uh, to talk about uh, strategies that we have going on within our office to help improve outcomes for people with disabilities in the community. Well, what's the most important issue that you think has been brought up today? Really, um, just accessibility and people being able to get access to different um, services and supports in their community so that they can live as independent lives as possible. So um, on, our health, on the health care panel this afternoon, we're going to have a panel. Um, I'll be there for our Office for Citizens with Developmental Disabilities. We'll also have uh, participants from our Office of Aging and Adult Services and Office of Behavioral Health um, within the Department of Health. And we're all going to be sharing what our upcoming plans are for the next year. 
um, in areas that will impact people with disabilities and where we plan on making systems improvements, um, whether that be through waiting lists that people are on, substance uh, use services in the community, um, or other service changes that we have going on in each of those areas. Well, what is the most important message that you've heard here today? For me, it's just the collaboration, the working together. That that no matter what we do in our in our in our society, how we fund it, how we finance it, that um, it's a community. We're community driven, and that everyone has a place, everyone has a purpose, and that you take everything into consideration, no matter what we do in finance. We had a conference, and it's called Connections. And again, it's the collaboration, the connection. It's the, the recognizing that you know we may fund housing, we may fund projects, we may do d developments that. Um, Sometimes you're not thinking of the whole, the totality, but when you come here and you work together, you realize that everything we do ha has a part and we all should be, con we should think about every piece that we do, no matter what our clientele is that we're serving. Knowing about the Louisiana Housing Corporation, we won our the, recently uh, the, become the balance of state in, in the state of Louisiana, which was new for the state. We've seen a lot of success in that. In fact, uh, our, our, our efforts continue to grow. Um, we have, um, from, our, from our focus, we've been able to do more in the last two years than we've ever been able to do. And we're seeing that trend picking up. And what happens when we do that is we see areas become better places to live, the quality of life improves, and it brings awareness. So this year, our corporation was the first time that we had an affordable housing conference for the state of Louisiana. And we had almost 600 participants. Fortune 500 companies that were sponsors all the way down to our advocacy groups. And in those two days, across the board, we were able to work with banks and our advocacy groups, uh, our social service providers, you know, those who are working with social justice, and those that are looking to have a rate of return on their income, all working together to serve the community. Um, why is this so important to you as a parent? Uh, because as I shared earlier in the class, um, when we were in kindergarten, they told us that he would never receive a diploma. And from that day, we started fighting, saying, why not? Why do we have to have a certificate? Why do we come to school every day, wear our uniform, show up, make sure that we're always here, and we can't graduate? And we kept pushing and pushing, and it ended up that the uh, Act 833 came along in 2016, which is the year that he graduated. He ended up graduating with a diploma. He ended up buying all of his own supplies for graduation, buying his own letterman jacket, getting himself ready for college. Um, he is now uh, starting his second year as a student in Lines Connected, and he is a member of a fraternity at Southeastern, something I never thought we would ever see. So all of the things that they said that he couldn't do, all we had to do was stand up and ask why, because there were other people asking the same questions and it opened it up for us. What have you learned in today's conference? In today's conference, I learned that we're not the only school that offers things like this, and a lot of them are geared on finding jobs, which is an amazing thing to me. Um, the only thing Christopher's ever wanted to be is just like his brothers. Everything they did, he wanted to do. They graduated, he, wa he wanted to graduate. Uh, you know, They're going to get married, he wants to get married. If you ask Christopher, what do you want to be, what do you want to do, he wants to be famous. So some of his ideas are far-fetched, but I support every one of them, and watching and seeing people that are doing jobs, that are going out into the community, working at, you know, one of them today was at a sheriff's office, one was at a clerk of court. Um, he works at Carter's Grocery Store. He's only working one day a week because he's in college, but one day I would like to see him obtain his dreams, and I saw that today. I got to see a bunch of people that were advertising that they can be a member of society. There's transportation to get them where they need to go. Um, I'm just excited. I'm excited to see that there's more after college. Well, this is important because it allows individuals with disabilities who are between the ages of 18 and 22 to remain in their high school uh, and also to go to a three-semester program where they're able to go to community college and get credit for courses or even audit courses if they can't do the ACT part. And they get to learn to travel the bus, travel the streetcar, uh, apprenticeship at jobs. It's, essentially, it's a pathway to a career and employment. Oh, this is a wonderful conference. We're very lucky to have a very competent Governor's Office of Disability Affairs, and we really appreciate the governor for being so positive about the hiring of people with disabilities and making sure that they're included in all aspects of the community. So this is, this is one of the best conferences I go to in this state. We look forward to it very much. Is there anything you'd like to add? 
Um, well, I just thank you to Bambi and her staff, and thank you to the governor and the folks that, that are with, with him. We, we really enjoy this, and it's very important work. We were invited here today to come and share information about services that are available for persons with substance use disorders and those persons that are suffering with opioid use disorders, and to share information about how persons can access care. The main message was to enlighten the community about all of the different services that we offer with the Office of Behavioral Health to address substance use disorders, in particularly with the opioid epidemic going on nationally and within Louisiana. We wanted to spread the word that we have funding available for persons with opioid use disorders, um, whereas if you are in need of care and you don't have insurance or Medicaid or any other financial supports, there's funding available for you if you're in need of services. So we are building capacity to increase access to care. So don't let funding or financial issues be a barrier to you seeking care. So if you are un or underinsured, don't let that be a barrier to you receiving assistance. There is services for you. So for more information about services available with the Office of Behavioral Health, go to opioidhelpla.org. We're presenting today to um, tell Louisiana residents with disabilities, the elderly, um, anybody who uses assistive technology devices um, about emergency preparedness and what they need to do you know, to be prepared for a disaster. We formed this coalition in 2006 as a way to inform emergency managers and to work with emergency managers to ensure that they are planning with and for people with disabilities, those that are aging and have access and functional needs. What, what would you message would you want the public to gain from the conference today? That um, they have rights and responsibilities, that um, you know, there are laws out there to protect people, but you have to be proactive and think about what you need during a disaster. So you need to, you know, take care of business beforehand um, so that you can be safe and, you know, uh, live independently even during a disaster. I like the fact that we got a rundown on the latest uh, laws of, um, you know, not only the ADA, um, but also the ABA. Uh, and um, the different website um, accessibility guidelines that they have out there. So that's really interesting to me. I would like to add this is a great venue to bring uh, providers together, to bring emergency managers together, to bring our state partners together, to give information and to help guide and empower our citizens into living independently and to be safe and, and in, our, in disasters, but to live independent lives day to day. We work with uh, individuals who have typically a diagnosis of an intellectual disability or autism spectrum as they work their way through further training to seek successful employment. And you've brought some others with you from your area. Yes. Would you like to introduce them? Yes, I have. I'd um, like to start with Ms. LaDawn Evans. Don, will you come here for a minute? LaDawn has um, lived on her own for 14 years now, and she worked for quite a while, but she had an injury, and she is getting further training to go back to work. She is actually a great example of the Olmstead Act because she's been living independently for 14 years. And how does, what would happen if you didn't have care providers? Where would, where would you be? Oh, uh, like a, um, nursing home or institution. And what would that be like? It won't be good. Why not? Because I believe that um, people on independent disability can live on their own and um, live for free and then instead go into a nursing home and they don't pay. But I think that disability is more important to be independent, be strong. We also have some students with us that um, are twice exceptional. And Mr. Ritz, Cody academically has lots of challenges, but from the time he was in school, he was um, identified as gifted in the area of art. And he was out of school for seven years. 
and decided and was encouraged to come back and he um, just earned his technical competency area in theater. Skills USA is something where students go and pursue an activity or do community service activity and compete with other um, schools across the country but, and the um, team from Bossier Parish Community College actually won nationals this year. I did uh, community action and it was uh, based on cosplay, something I got into and helped me come out and it helps other people come out too. Um, I did a project, me and my sister, we did a presentation and went to nationals and we won uh, gold first place, uh, there's the medal. It shows that the, what they did was they identified heroes and identified their strengths and to bring out you know, how they have abilities and, and not just disabilities. And Mr. Batto? It was my dream to be in college and things like that. And a lot of people my age love sports and super nice people. Okay. Jamie works um, in the, his, the company works with the oil industry and they work with fleet services so he had been doing some work already but he was able to earn his OSHA um, safety certification and also was able to get your license for what? Forklift license. For, for, he's, he's the licensed forklift driver. Very good, very so good. And crane operator. Oh, he did get experience. Experience. Operating a crane. So we're able to do um, the industrial technology, and if they're able to get the license in it, they're able to earn that. And um, before, they, if they didn't have a typical high school diploma, that might have been a barrier to further. Training. What would you want the public to be aware of that maybe they're not? I, I think, again, the focus on disability rather than ability. And we have so many people with amazing abilities and that that just because you can't tick off the box when you apply for a job 98 percent is the figure that I've heard of if you can't say you have a high school credential they won't even look at you and that it's just far too restrictive you, there needs to be a way for these people to be seen to get beyond that you know the gate of 98 percent is just too much our program focuses on employability. Uh, even conservative estimates state that 80% of individuals with disabilities are unemployed. And they are a vast, mostly untapped resource of, of, of workers, to, uh, which would make a difference to Louisiana's bottom line economically. It's wonderful to see uh, the group of people. Uh, if the parking situation indicates that, that, that there's a lot of participation, which means that awareness is growing, and with awareness uh, comes progress. As a state, you know, it's wonderful in the direction that we're heading in, and hopefully you know, people, as they gain awareness, will reach out and you know, give their support. It's definitely important to us because we always look at the ADA issues that we have throughout our community and trying to make sure that we're improving and bringing in different technologies and things that we can do to improve disability issues and issues throughout our community for all our citizens there in the shreveport Bojo region. I think today we're learning a, a great knowledge of information. A lot of the staff members are here, um, the Shreveport, City of Shreveport's ADA coordinators here, and it's offering an opportunity for them to learn different information that other cities have done throughout the city, throughout the state, as well as throughout the country, and it's bringing that opportunity to bring back to our community to support the needs of our community. From my own personal perspective, we see our needs each day, and one thing that brings joy to my heart is meeting the needs of our citizens both, you know, ones with disabilities and ones without disabilities. I believe that everyone is equal and should be treated that way, and these are the type of opportunities that allows us to be able to make those things happen. I think the conference is so important because it's an opportunity for parents, professionals, advocates to network, to see what's available for people with disabilities, and to come together in one place. And our governor is so supportive of individuals with disabilities, and for someone like me and for what I do, I think that's critical. What's your reaction to today's conference? I think it's outstanding. There's so many people here who have the one goal to make better lives for individuals with disabilities. And I think it's a great place to be, one location. It's just awesome. Uh, our program is uh, twofold. One, 
fold is for students with intellectual disabilities on a certificate track, who Sean and Paige are graduates of our program. And we also have a degree seeking track for students that are on a traditional degree path with um, autism or on the spectrum. Could you introduce our other guest here? Sure, this is Paige Fauché. Paige is a graduate of our Bridge Certificate Program and she is currently employed with the Thibodeau Recreation Department. She has her driver's license and she is living independently. Very good. And we also have Sean Adams. Sean is also a program completer of our certificate program. He is also employed with the Lafouche Parish District Attorney's Office. Oh, I'm sorry. The that's the, uh, the, clerk. the clerk of court, excuse me. And um, he is also living independently. Uh, they graduated over a year ago, so they have been working and living independently for over a year now. Do you have, what is your reaction to today's conference? It's awesome. We, we enjoy this conference. We come every year. We talk about our program, of course, so that people know about us. And we also get so much information for us to bring back and share with our students and families. So we're very appreciative. Is there anything you'd like to add? What's been your favorite thing today? Uh, my favorite thing is that um, learning about the conference and um, also, my favorite thing of the British program is to hang out with friends. For me, it, for, the, uh, for the conference, it's the educational rise of, every, of each different program, even the British Independence program. And I have enjoyed it with the incredible moments I've made with so not just my friends, but also my family. It's important that people have the information, understand what services are available, and also a way that they can become involved um, and advocate on issues that are important to people with disabilities.